This episode is brought to you by Maps of the Mind and their upcoming course, Revolutions, starting November 1st. It is a deep dive course for psychedelic explorers. If you head to mapsofthemind.com slash r dash evolution, so revolution with a dash between the R and the E, and you use the promo code GESSO, you will get 15% off your order. Again, the course starts November 1st and the promo code will last until then. If you tune into the end, I will tell you more about this course and I will also tell you about an added possible discount that will only be existing for a short amount of time. So tune in to the end. And now here's the opening music. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This is a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, always with the underlying question of how it is we can work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, uh, not just for ourselves, but for those we care about, those who extend beyond those we care about, those whom we have never met, and those who will follow us after we leave this world. And uh, today's interview is with Chris Killam, and we're going to talk about yoga and cannabis. We're going to talk about his, his new book, The Lotus and the Bud, Cannabis, Consciousness, and Yoga Practice. Uh, in continuing with the trend I've been doing over the last few episodes, I have written an overture for this one as well. And here goes. Cannabis and yoga, a match made through history in the lands from which yoga comes but a novel concept to the yoga of the West. Here in the dominant culture of North America, drugs are bad, okay? And same can be said inside of North American spiritual practice as well. But in all seriousness, there is a long history of drug stigma here in North America, some of which simply ignorance, and some of it more nefarious, such as using drugs in the image of the drug user as a political scapegoat for criminalizing on the basis of race and political ideology. The very foundation of cannabis prohibition was political lobbying on behalf of a racist zealot named Harry J. Angslinger, who pushed for the criminalization of cannabis as a means to subjugate black and Hispanic people. I wrote an article on this called Cannabis is a Gateway Drug. It's going to be linked in the show notes here. Another example is the criminalization of psychedelics under Nixon was reportedly done to create the legal means to stamp down on the Black Panthers and the anti-war movement, that it didn't actually have anything to do with the drugs. And yes, cannabis is slowly being legalized across various states in the U.S. and the world, such as in my country, Canada, where uh, its federal status allows for commercial sales and adult recreational use. Also, psychedelics are on the up and up due to clinical research and various decriminalization movements. Nevertheless, the consequences of all this prohibition and stigma was the creation of cultures of drug use that are divorced from their deeply spiritual and even religious use, such as cannabis and other psychedelics, and spiritual practices that are divorced from their historically used drugs, such as yoga. So, yoga and cannabis... Consider sadhus, uh, bang, hashish, and ganja. There's a rich history of cannabis being involved in yoga practice, but very little legwork for cannabis and yoga in the Western world. Not none, but it is still only blossoming here, blossoming through the cracks in the concrete slabs of the historically racist prohibitionist worldview. So where does all that leave us? Well, I would say at an amazing place of opportunity to explore, rediscover, and learn from these powerful plants and their place in spiritual practice. However, any of us paying attention over the last few years are forced to acknowledge that the risks of spiritual practice and insular so-called spiritual ideologies are not negligible 
such as spiritual narcissism, psychosis, delusional thinking, and the abuses and abuses of power, to name a few. On top of that, we have similar concerns with drug use. So with regards to exploring the possibilities of yoga and cannabis, for example, together, what risks are we posing to ourselves? It is with these two lines of inquiry in mind, the benefits, the his, the benefits and the risks, that we welcome Chris Killam to Adventures Through the Mind to talk about the lotus and the bud, the combining of cannabis and yoga as a spiritual practice, the benefits of doing so, and the risks we run in the process. Chris Killam is the medicine hunter. That's his uh, moniker. Uh, he is an author, educator, and TV personality who has conducted medicinal plant research in over 45 countries and lectures worldwide about holistic wellness and botanical medicines. As a speaker and guest expert on TV in the U.S. and international markets, he advocates for traditional botanical medicines, including psychoactive and psychedelic plant medicines, such as cannabis. Chris has been featured in the New York Times, Outside Magazine, Forbes, Psychology Today, Playboy, LA Weekly, and Newsweek, and appeared on CNN, NBC Nightly News, The Dr. Oz Show, ABC Good Morning America, ABC Nightline, ABC 2020, and many other top-tier media venues. He has written 15 books which have been published in over 28 languages. Some of his books include The Ayahuasca Test Pilot's Handbook, Psyche Delicacies, and The Five Tibetans. His newest book is called The Lotus and the Bud. I'm holding it up on the screen here on YouTube. Consciousness, Cannabis Consciousness and Yoga Practice. Chris Killam joins us on Adventures Through the Mind to explore yoga, cannabis, and yoga and cannabis. We also explore the spirit of cannabis, psychedelics in general as a part of spiritual practice, and the dangerous pitfalls of spiritual narcissism and delusions that arise from all spiritual practice, and especially insular spiritual communities. So Chris is on the show. That's the overture. That's what we're going to get into today, and uh, pretty excited Pretty excited to do so. It was a fun interview to have. Chris is a very smart guy, obviously, and very insightful on these topics. And as you'll hear at the beginning of the interview, a long-standing yoga practitioner, yogi, I guess, might, might count, uh, count as the term here. Before we get into the interview, big thank you to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out. Those people give extensively, some of which for a long time. Without you patrons, the show would not be able to exist because I would not be able to put my full-time hours into this. So this is my full-time job. This is my full-time work. And it's what I believe to be a part of my work in the world to produce this show and also to producing the body of work that supports the show. Presently, outside of the show, I'm, I'm writing a book, but that's aside. Um, and so, or, or another book. Um, and I love, I deeply love the fact that I am able to produce something that I feel has value for me and possibly has value for the world. And, or at least I, I hope it does. I, I intend for it to hopefully do, you know, and that I can put that out there for free and that people generously and voluntarily offer back financial support um, and financial acknowledgement for the value they're receiving. And that I am able to earn a living doing this thing that I care about in a system of, of sort of generosity res and reciprocity and, and mutual connection around cared care abouts, you know, such as things happening in psychedelic culture. And uh, that's beautiful. And I'm so grateful. And uh, if you are listening to the show right now, and you're getting a lot of value from it, and you're not able to financially contribute, don't worry about it. Enjoy it. You know, it's free. It's for you. Um, the people who do contribute are helping to create that situation, to create the opportunity for those who cannot to be able to uh, enjoy the show, uh, to derive whatever value you're going to derive from it. Uh, if you can afford to throw me a little bit of cash for enjoying the show, I ask you to do so um, because this is an independent podcast and it's how I earn my living. So thank you so much for doing so. Not asking for much, just the equivalent of about a cup of coffee once a month. Um, so please do so. And uh, if you're also, I'd say this, if you're not necessarily supporting this show, please support some other independent podcasts. Um, 
corporate corporate podcasts are starting to take over and uh, it's good now for us to be su- supporting the creators we believe in before they get usurped by corporate interests like everything coming out of the subculture ends up being once it gets popular so yeah support an independent podcast if it's mine awesome thank you and you can do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash james w gesso thank you for listening to the intro to this episode uh and um enjoy this interview with chris killam on adventures to the mind episode 151 great so uh christopher killam medicine hunter welcome to adventures to the mind well, thanks, James. It's good to be here with you. It's been a while since I've seen you, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a little while longer before we actually get to see each other in person. But hello, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back back before back in a, in a time before face coverings, or at least a right, mandatory right, face right. coverings, we got to share respiratory space with without a care in the world, really. Without a care in the world, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, and uh, actually, you know. Uh, I have multiple times been like, hey, it'd be good to have you on the show. And uh, then I got contacted by um, by your publishing house, letting mm-hmm. me know that you have this book coming out, The Lotus in the Bud. And I was like, oh, cool. And also great opportunity to uh, <laughs> in, to to create a podcast around. So I, uh, I read The Lotus in the Bud, thought it was fantastic, very interesting, learned a bit about you that I did not know. Oh. Um, which is actually what I'd like to start the podcast off about since the Lotus in the bud is about yoga and cannabis and yoga and cannabis. Um, right. what I didn't know about you, which I think would be a great place to start off is the history and background you have in yoga practice. Well, yeah, that goes back a while, James. Um, I had a, a kind of an affinity for yoga, even as a little kid, though I confess I knew actually knew nothing about it. I knew how to sit in a full lotus pose and would do that endlessly just because I liked it, you know, for some reason. But basically, um, I had an attraction to it. And uh, eventually, when I was in my teens, I started around 18, I started to meditate and practice yoga, and I've maintained a practice ever since Mm. Um, for a number of years, as I described in The Lotus and the Bud, I lived in a yoga ashram, and we were uh, we were fire-breathing maniacs. We were doing <laughs> five to eight hours of yoga a day. We were completely out of our skulls. And um, what, you know, although my, my practice has certainly calmed down from then, the beautiful thing, once I kind of returned to planet earth from that experience was that it was very easy to maintain a practice of say a couple hours a day you know that's just like oh sure that's a breeze so uh it gave me a good foundation and i have learned from a great number of teachers and been initiated into various uh methods of kundalini practice and and you know met yogis and lamas and sages of all different times who've helped me out and it's been a remarkable and rewarding path and i have absolutely no idea what life would be like without yoga practice but i'm sure it would be a poorer and less healthy experience for me Hmm. yeah reading reading your book hearing the background of your time with yoga like you said the fire breathing maniacs thing the intensity of what you're doing in that ashram i was just like whoa and maybe maybe now is not the time a little bit later we could talk about sort of what happens when people get a little bit too extreme in insulated spiritual communities um if that comes up (laughs) but um yeah, one thing that you brought up, and, and I'm, I'm going off the rails on my question here because it feels really relevant to me. One thing that you brought up was having injured your back really significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I injured my back really significantly last year, and it's been one thing to the next to the next, and now finally got confirmation that I have herniated discs, which mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, that sucks, but I have a sense of what it is now. And you sure. talk about having, if I remember correctly, yoga and cannabis having helped you sort of start to recover from that or maybe it was just yoga that helped you recover then i can't remember exactly the story well i've suffered three pretty serious traumatic head and spinal injuries and i i don't need to go through them all but um in one i broke my seventh cervical vertebra so i was in great pain tremendous pain 
and actually was in chronic pain for four years. Mm. Um, but what happened was that I, uh, I was advised by a friend to try smoking some cannabis for the pain. And, you know, I, I had not smoked for probably six or seven years at that point and had never during the time that I had utilized cannabis, you know, when I was younger, I'd never done it for pain. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have a sense that that was a thing, which is kind of funny considering, you know, what I know now, but in any case, um, I also at the very same time, and it was just kind of a curious, uh, coming together of factors read about a man who I believe was a neurologist at Beth Israel hospital in Boston, who was also advising chronic pain patients to learn to sit in full Lotus. He had had some experience showing that that could help to reduce pain. So I wound up sitting in full Lotus after smoking cannabis and found that um, in, in many instances in which I was suffering just really excruciating pain, I could over the course of a few minutes bring that pain down either to very little or to nothing at all. Hmm. The only rub <laughs> was that I had to remain <laughs> in Lotus position. So once I get out of that, I would be in pain again, but it, it was an oasis and that really tipped me off to, um, the synergy of yoga and cannabis, uh, as certainly for pain alleviation. And, and it was kind of a doorway experience in, in a, in a manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then let's, let's, let's get into that then. So that, that was how you got introduced to combining the two. <clears throat> um, in your book, you talk about your own story with yoga and with cannabis and with yoga and cannabis. Um, but then you also take quite a bit of time to outline sort of the philosophy of yoga and a number of elements in um, in regards to how the practice of yoga fits into the spirituality and philosophy of yoga before going into a bunch about the cannabis plant and then combining them and then tips and advice and a whole sequence uh, for people to try out. Um, so maybe we can we can start further edging into this conversation by giving us a sense of of like spiritually, you know, what is and what is the point of yoga and where does cannabis fit into that that produces this synergistic effect? People will uh, give different explanations of yoga for sure, James. Um, mine is based on my experience and and I don't know that there's any objectivity to it particularly, but um, I perceive yoga actually as a current, a wisdom current that goes through hum, human history. And it's something that we can tap into and we do so with various methods that are referred to as yoga methods. Um, postures that help to open up our nerves and, and activate more energy in our bodies and meditation methods that subdue the chatter of the mind and bring us into a, a greater awareness of just pure sense of self. Um, and really the idea of yoga is to live in a harmonious manner, in an integrated manner, and in a, in a joyful manner. Um, wise and high and kind and, and loving basically. And, and that is, and, and if there is an actual objective end point enlightenment, it's the, the full realization of the self as being indivisible from the entire rest of the universe and everything that is and everything that isn't. So, um, within that, uh, context, you know, there are a lot of different methods, um, I mean, some of the uh, real original yoga texts say there are only two postures that matter. Everything else, yeah, you can do them, you can not do them, whatever. But they just happen to be two sitting meditation postures. Because at the end of the day, fundamentally, it is, it is traveling with your mind into your interior, into a, uh, an awareness that isn't 
filled with chatter, that isn't filled with self-ideation, that isn't making comparisons, that isn't having conversations with ourselves, just pure open consciousness. Being able to dwell in that is to live in, in basically a graceful, harmonious, and healthy state. So that's really, that's my understanding of yoga and also my understanding of its purpose uh, for those of us, because we are spiritual beings living in, in physical bodies, and we must attend to the entire integration of everything that we are, and yoga helps us to do that in, in a very wonderful way, I think. Hmm. So <clears throat> I have a, the, the follow-up to that is, is of course, like, where does, where does cannabis explicitly fit in? Um, and that answer could be, you know, both like practical, philosophical, spiritual, historical. Um, and but I want to b- before we go there, I want to make a mental note al- aloud so it's held in the space between us around um, around the practice of yoga, spiritual practice, and moving toward this sort of disposition that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And maybe this goes back to the insular community thing. Some of the pitfalls of, along the way that might negatively impact your ability to actually be in that place and not just be a spiritual narcissist. So, well, actually, I, let me just address that. Um, you know, this whole spiritual narcissism is a fashionable conversation right now. Um, we are deluded, period. Every last bloody one of us is deluded. Yeah, yeah. We are ignorant in some manner. We're mistaken in some manners. Um, we do some things well and some things poorly. That is for real the actual human condition. Mm-hmm. And so as we practice, whatever we practice, uh, meditation, um, tai chi, uh, you know, yoga, um, other, you know, forms of self-awareness, whatever those might be, we're naturally going to bring the entirety of our mixed up being to that practice. Hmm. So yes, of course it's possible to be a spiritual narcissist. Hmm. Um, of course it's possible to be, uh, you know, to be messianic, uh, it's possible to just be completely, totally whack doodle, ignorant and crazy, even though you might be doing seven minutes of headstands every morning first thing and then, you know, on from there and all the other stuff and whatever yogurt enemas, name it, okay? Um, <laughs> we can all go wrong. There is no guaranteeing against that. And um, certainly an insular community whether it's a a monastic community, whether it's an ashram setting, it has an advantage and a disadvantage. The advantage is is that it can be a very good container uh, for people to practice, for people to share this commonality of purpose. But it can also be truly isolated, and uh, over time, people can get really cuckoo. Mm-hmm. And imagine, you know, that they've sort of got like a better grip on the universe than others do. And that's just plain wrong. Mm-hmm. We're all bozos on this bus. Uh, you know, the whole thing of enlightenment, it is extremely unlikely that we're going to be enlightened in this lifetime. But we can live in an enlightened manner. And if we can adhere to certain principles like being compassionate, being caring, being observant of others, being open-hearted, then we can at least reduce, not eliminate, but reduce our tendency toward assholeness, narcissism, and foolish thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also uh, <laughs> you know, beha- behaviors that are, are, are abuses of power, which are, of course, right, also right. issues that can come up right. in insular communities, especially ones following some sort of uh, divine or, you know, right. uh, some, some sort of central figure that is on high to the rest. Yeah, hierarchical structures are toxic to the start, right. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I thought about while you were talking about that there was about, um, well, psychedelics, about how context of use makes a huge difference as to what your experiences are. Um, right. And sort of context of use in the sense of what is the larger context of your life in which the context of the ceremonial exploration is nested has a huge influence on, you know, like the experience and its impact in your life. 
And part of that context is mindset, but also part of that mindset context is the people you're with and how willing you are to be checked by them and challenged by them. Um, as long as some of the fundamental principles you said, compassion, open heartedness, stuff like that is is present. And just thinking about how similar similar things can happen in psychedelics as as what you just described in the <laughs> you said as holiness, but I like the idea of like as holiness um, of um, uh, uh, you know, that just comes into, comes into the yoga practice, the spiritual practice, the psychedelic practice. Um, and, uh, I thought of, uh, something out of one of your podcast episodes where you talked about getting messages from ayahuasca and I can't remember exactly what it, what it is. I actually quote you in the book that I'm writing right ah. now from this specific oh, episode, you. which was something like, you kind of have to keep in mind that although it might've showed you that in your experience, you were like in a messianic something or other, that doesn't mean you're the Messiah kind of thing. And that well, that critical yes. appraisal is very important. Well, you know, with meditation and, and with psychedelics and with cannabis, you can have this great amplification of everything. Amplification of sensation, amplification of mind, you know, that's part of the purpose. And um, that can also... Uh, give people an exaggerated sense of self mm -hmm. relative to everybody else. Yes, we are all, in fact, the Messiah, all 7.2 billion of us, and nobody more or less than anybody else. Um, but yeah, we're all that, um, <laughs> rather than, oh yeah, that guy over there or that woman over there, yeah, they're the Messiah. That's bogus thinking. And what you were asking earlier about the... Uh, the ways that uh, cannabis and yoga come together. Um, they both, in, in, um, in Hindu mythology, they're both uh, believed to derive from the Hindu god Shiva, who is the god of yoga and also the god of cannabis. And, and theoretically, anyway, Shiva bestowed both upon humanity so that we could enjoy harmony and bliss and, and, and the pleasures of, of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of divine inspiration. Um, in point of fact, it, it really does seem that cannabis is ideally suited to us because just as yoga, um, you know, I describe in, in The Lotus and the Bud how yoga tunes up the nervous system and does so in a beautiful way so that our, our nerves are, are more like piano wires that, that ping perfect, harmonious, exact notes rather than some alarming off-key sound. And uh, it's also the case that cannabis satisfies our endocannabinoid system, which regulates pretty much everything in our bodies. So um, the two have enormous harmonizing effects of in and of themselves, and coming together, uh, they actually enhance practice in, in many different ways, especially in terms of sensitivity to sensation and to energy, because uh, we're just a bundle of energy. We're all energy all the time. Uh, and, and a greater capacity even to go deeply into oneself. I, I do say in the book, and I mean that I believe very strongly that if you're practicing yoga, it's wise and, and smart to develop your practice without cannabis every bit as much as you do with so that you really have the chops on your own. But, uh, I find the two enormously beneficial and, for people who are in pain or, or in discomfort, uh, it can really help them to practice. Hmm. Cool. Uh, that was a, you, you answered a question that I had for later about uh, about the non non spiritual benefits uh, mm. for people who aren't necessarily inclined uh, in, inclined into the more sort of spiritual philosophical side of the practice. Um, I'm still sort of sitting with uh, with this curiosity around around. Um, practice substance practice spiritual practice and the you know the cultivation of a healthier more stable sense of self because mm -hmm. you know it's not that we have experiences that dissolve the self right and ideally we dissolve the self we dissolve the self into a place of being connected with something deeper more fundamental something of caring something that holds us you know we feel that and then we reintegrate ourselves based in that tighter foundation, more love for ourselves, And so our sense of self actually 
it's it, it gets stronger in a good way rather than maybe being like frail before but and it, but it gets stronger in a good way but it could also get stronger in a way where we sort of adopt some of the adopt some ideas that aren't necessarily reflective of what's actually happening like i am jesus right right you're, you're not i am kind of thing and it makes right. me think of um the late the late james orock and his work around talking about psychedelics the ego being like a muscle mm -hmm. and uh you know you break it down and then it grows back stronger again you got to be mindful of how you're doing it so that you know when it grows back stronger it grows back stronger in a good way well, and that's why that's where I think that being around a lot of talented and intelligent people is very useful and and valuable. Um, you get a sense of proportion of yourself. You know, uh, I mean, we we live in bodies, we live in society. You know, we're not isolated on our own asteroids doing yoga and doing psychedelics. You know, we're in this vast oceanic mix of human beings. And you know, if you spend time around uh, talented, capable people, you realize if you also are talented and capable, yeah, you're just one more. Mm -hmm. And that you know that proportion is really critical. Because if we really are going to be not only transformed in a positive way by practice and by the uh, intelligent utilization of psychedelics, um, if we're also going to be emissaries, if we're going to carry the medicine, if we're going to represent that healing and not just have an experience and then go back to, you know, bitching about the long line at Starbucks, um, you know, whatever it is, then, you know, we, we must remember it, A lot of this is remembrance. It's remembering the peace, remembering the integration, remembering the sense of care and connectedness to all beings, you know, that we often experience in a heightened, um, ayahuasca state, peyote state, mushroom state, LSD state, whatever that might be carrying that forward otherwise these are these experiences are are often not more than entertainments mm -hmm. it's the fulfillment of them as we wander around in our lives whatever our our roles in society are um that's where we really enjoy the perpetual fruits of the medicine if you will mm -hmm. right and also sort of give give back in a way for what it's offered you by being sure. a person who is reflect, like you said, emissary, <laughs> whenever I hear that word, I think of deep space nine, but, um, <laughs> you know, being an emissary of, uh, of, of the, of the medicine by being a good person, you know, right. letting it, letting it touch the world through you as well. Well, th and that's why in uh, yoga practice, you not only have, um, you know, breathing and meditation and asanas and cleansing and, and diet and all that, but you also have uh, principles to live by, mm -hmm. you know, being honest, being nonviolent, you know, uh, concern for others, reverence, you know, it, they mean basic stuff, kind of like Boy Scout motto stuff in a way, um, because these guiding principles help us to, you know, stay within um, healthy and um, m sort of mutually harmonious parameters. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're violent, if you're stealing, if you're uh, being abusive, if you're doing whatever, then you're basically living outside of the boundaries of what works for the entire scheme in which you find yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about the term of a uh, like a uh, internal keep creating some sort of levees, <laughs> you know, to keep mm -hmm. the keep keep the 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 nourish like the the waters, the divine waters from overflowing into the wrong places. Right, um, right. So, okay, so we talking about cannabis, talking about psychedelics. So now, I have two questions. One of which is like yoga and psychedelics compared to yoga and cannabis. But first, maybe that comparison is languaged improperly because perhaps you consider cannabis is psychedelic do you feel cannabis is a psychedelic and why well cannabis is a psychedelic uh, is is a dose dependent issue um when i back in the early 80s took a chickpea sized ball of uh nepalese black hash and put it inside a dried apricot and chewed it and washed it down with uh, hot tea i tripped my ass off for about 
15 hours. I bet. I was, yeah. I was stratospheric. I mean, I was, you know, I was NASA ready in like 40 minutes and I was just gone, baby gone. And it was an amazing day. Um, that was really extreme, you know, but yes, you know, we have a long history actually of people using cannabis as a profoundly uh, powerful visionary aid, a full on psychedelic. We saw that, um, in kind of more recent times in the Club de Hashishin in Paris, in the, I believe the late 1800s, Victor Hugo and the gang, they ate this um, hashish jam called Dawa Mask, and they just full on tripped. And then they wrote about it and these lavish, lavish visionary experiences. Um, so we, we do have a long history of people utilizing uh, large oral amounts of cannabis as full-on psychedelic. Um, it scares a lot of people. That's part of the problem is uh, people often wind up feeling that they're in the grips of, <laughs> of something just, you know, hideously wrong and way too overwhelming and, you know, kind of like finding yourselves in the jaws of a giant Rottweiler. So it's sometimes tough for people. Um, but yes, I absolutely do, uh, include cannabis as a psychedelic. And, and I really do believe that it's, it's almost entirely when it's oral and that's dose dependent. But I also think this, that, you know, we are living in a unique time as everybody in history does. Everybody in history lives in a time that, you know, is unique. Ours, we're, we're insanely busy. Uh, there's tremendous stress and pressure. Uh, there are enormous uh, environmental problems, a tremendous disruption between nations and inequities of all different kinds. And, you know, we're not practicing spirituality like back in the days of 500 million people on Earth and folks meditating in caves for a couple of decades. That's not what's going on here. Um, we're, you know, doing what we can. And what I believe is that if you can also utilize psychedelics, um, effectively and intentionally and purposefully, you can have deep, deep, deep immersion experiences that are not typical, uh, with everyday practice of yoga and meditation or Tai Chi or whatever, um, sometimes but very rarely, but readily accessible with uh, psychedelics. And that in the kind of ebb and flow of practice, what I find is that these experiences give me energy. Uh, I find them very clarifying. I find that, for example, uh, you know, on two different occasions after drinking ayahuasca heavily for a week at a time, um, two different times, I had to go immediately to a trade show in Las Vegas. Okay, It was just kind of a stupid schedule. But what I found was that the medicine gave me this curious fluidity to just kind of go through the thing and go, oh, wait a minute, I get it. This is just another part of the journey. Right. Okay. So I, I think that the psychedelics can be enormously helpful to us in our practice by giving us deep, deep immersion experiences, by refreshing us, by opening us up, kind of clearing the dirt out of our garden hoses, you know, all of that. Um, and, and, and providing us with um, brilliant moments of illumination that inspire us and carry us forward. Hmm. So, <clears throat> and cannabis fitting into uh, into those in, into that pocket. So, sure. one of the things you talk about in your book is the spirit of cannabis, the spirit of the cannabis. So, my my wondering here is poorly formed. I think as I speak it, it'll become a question and maybe you'll make sense of it in the process. Um, which is talking about cannabis as a, as a medicine or as a, you know, just like, what's it say, a plant, a psychoactive that we can consume and you mm. bring it on board into your yoga practice, right? And it seems like yoga is a, is a, is a, if I, if I am to assume sort of like an active way of being in relationship with this 
harmony or working towards being in harmonious relationship with life or what mm -hmm. have you. When we bring something else on board, something that has a spirit, something that has a spirit, as you suggest in your book, that maybe you could communicate with, what's the influence on that relationship there from a, from a communicating with the spirit of a plant sort of thing? Where does, where does cannabis fit inside of a yoga session? Where does yoga fit inside of communicating with the plant? Well, I think that yoga gives us greater sensitivity to everything across the board. So it's going to give us greater sensitivity to an, an intuitive understanding of cannabis and the experience that can be had with cannabis. That's my experience anyway. But with regard to the spirit of the plant itself, um, this is a hard notion for those of us who didn't grow up in the forest. Um, for people in the Amazon, uh, you know, many of the shamans that I've spent time with over the last 24 years or so, um, you know, for them, it's just an everyday thing, communing with the spirits of plants and gaining information and knowledge uh, from those plants in different ways. It's just part of, of getting your messages about life. For us, it's a harder consideration because we've been uh, brought up in a more mechanistic way of thinking about things. And, 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 you know, we don't really allow plant spirit. But with cannabis, um, if you can, even as an act of imagination, letting yourself off the hook from believing it, um, you know, focus on the cannabis, um, invoke the spirit of the cannabis, invite it to open up its secrets to you. Then at the very least, again, my experience your time in that cannabis space will be richer and more fulfilling just in terms of the total pleasure and delight of it. And you may find yourself actually having sort of energetic um, interflow with this immense presence. I certainly have. Um, you know, this is, as I think you know very well, um, not an unfamiliar idea. Um, certainly, you know, with uh, many of the ayahuasca shamans, uh, they emphasize dieting on different plants, on becoming familiar with the spirits of those plants and developing uh, an ally relationship <clears throat> with those spirits. And I think that we can do that with cannabis. I also believe that the spirit of cannabis is absolutely gigantic, immense, unlike very few plants out there, possible exception being coffee and tea, um, you know, with just this global power to communicate and a tremendous capacity to seep its way into all sectors of society, regardless of the penalties, mm. which have been considerable over time. Um, so I would submit to you that the spirit of cannabis is immense, that the fundamental and intrinsic nature of, of the benefits of cannabis are healing and integrative. And, and yes, also, if you just plain want to get stoned and go on a long walk in the woods, I mean, that's a good, wonderful thing. And that should not be downplayed as lesser, you know, it's part of the delightful experience of being a human being. Mm -hmm. But I do think there is a big, big spirit there. Mm. So then how do you think that spirit compares or contrasts its message or what it wants from us compared to, say, the spirits of ayahuasca or psilocybin or uh, peyote? Well, you and I, for example, um, advocate psychedelics in, in what are hopefully intelligent ways, okay? Well, you do it differently than I do, hmm. and you have different experiences than I do. At the end of the day, we're both encouraging people to give these things consideration and if they engage with them to do so in wise and and hopefully intentional ways that will you know minimize difficulties and maximize benefits um, but we do it differently and i think that's true of of all these medicines i mean there's a reason that every last one of them in their own cultures is called the medicine 
Mm. Okay. You know, San Pedro's the medicine. Peyote's the medicine. Ayahuasca's the medicine. You know, ganja, it's the medicine. I mean, we can go on with this, but they're all called this because they're fundamentally and intrinsically healing in nature and revelatory as well. Um, but I do think that their spirits are different. I mean, ayahuasca is tough. I was, you know, I mean, I've drunk it an awful lot of times, like 135 times. And, and I know there are people out there who've done it thousands of times. It's not a contest, but, um, it's rough play, uh, mushrooms. I don't find mushrooms rough. Hmm. I find them friendly and uh, a little bit more playful. And, uh, it's not that ayahuasca is, you know, just a brute, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, it can be more of the sort of head first into the chipper shredder than some other things. Uh, the, the nature of San Pedro, for example, I find with San Pedro, you know, which I've, I've got a decent amount of experience with you drink it, you consume it. And then boom, you're just in the place you want to be, you know, no suffering, no nothing, just, okay, for a while, we're going to hang out in this luminous beaming, uh, place. So I, I think they're all different in nature. And, uh, a lot of what attracts us, uh, to one or the other has to do with our own personality and, and also opportunity and availability, all of that put together. Hmm. Do you think that, um, we're looking at, well, different cultivars of cannabis produce wildly different results based on different sort of terpene and cannabinoid profiles and different experiences with different cultivars can create a different sense of what that plant is or isn't. Sure. Do you think that there is just one singular intelligence, or sorry, pardon me, you didn't use the word intelligent, um, spirit that is expressing itself in a multifaceted way? Or is there a personality, for lack of better words, not trying to personify, but is there a personality to each cultivar, each plant that is unique unto itself in a way as well? And here's the additional question, are then all those different personalities all benevolent? Well, okay. There are different ways to think about this. How I think about it is not whether Kali Mist is going to have a different personality than blueberry cheesecake or whether that's going to have a dis different personality than, you know, Girl Scout cookies or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is that whatever you infuse with, whatever you elevate yourself with, you can use that moment and that time as a portal to the spirit of cannabis. And, um, you know, when you look at the Buddhist and Hindu iconography, they do a very clever thing. They'll take, a, say, a goddess like Tara, for example, uh, who is an emanation of any number of attributes, but there'll be a green Tara, a white Tara, a red Tara, a black Tara, a blue Tara. And they're all, um, they're all basically embodiments of different dimensions of, uh, expression. You know, one may be more wrathful, one may be more, um, just sort of serene and, 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 but they all basically come together as this sort of one goddess. And I think that, um, in the, in the world of, uh, cannabis, you know, all of these different varieties, all of these different cultivars, they're expressions of the plant. Mm -hmm. They're expressions of cannabis sativa period. That's what they are. And so I think that, that regardless of the different things that, that might be expressed, something that makes you more uh, kind of, you know, hey, I want to go out and split wood. Let's go for a hike. Or, or something that's like, you know, why don't we just take a nap? Um, you know, whatever that medicine is, I believe you can use it as a portal to get to the spirit of cannabis. Mm. And you do you believe that spirit of cannabis is fundamentally 
uh, benevolent or having goodwill towards us? Or is it something more responsive? Is it determined by the relationship? Is it, can you piss cannabis off, for example, and have it act like a bit shitty with you in, 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 in response? I, I don't really anthropomorphize the plants. Um, I don't have any reason to believe from like 54 years of experience with cannabis <laughs> that you can sort of piss it off. Mm. I really don't think so. I think that you can um, entangle yourself in your own mind with ideas and notions and concerns and fears that might seem like you have pissed off cannabis. And that's the interiorization of all kinds of snagged lines in our own ways of thinking. Um, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I believe, look, some people can obviously and do utilize cannabis to an extreme that is deleterious to them. I, I knew a guy who, you know, was awake and baker every single day, heavy, 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 like nobody I ever met in my entire life. And, and he died. Okay. He just plain died. Uh, he died young. Um, so no, I don't think it's all benign, but I do think that, uh, I mean, just like, you know, I, I mean, set and setting obviously play important roles. Uh, as I think it was Baudelaire said, do not, do not attempt this if you have bills to pay or some disagreeable affairs to tend to. <laughs> you know? Um. <laughs> so let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to I wanna ask you about the ECS, the endocannabinoid system. You go into pretty good detail about this in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is going way out of that spiritual shamanistic realm and down into like the, the, the materiality of the thing. Um, and you talked about it benefiting yoga from a physical health perspective as yoga being a sort of a practice of tuning the nervous system to be closer to a piano wire and further away from, uh, headphones that you earbuds that you shoved into your pocket and tried to get into your ear at the time that you needed it, but never quick enough. And anyways, um, so can you talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system and sure. with that, the, the pharmacology of the plant, what is in the plant and what is it doing in the brain and in the body? Okay. Uh, this is the super duper brief crash course and, uh, incomplete to boot. Um, uh, Back uh, not too far ago, uh, back in the uh, 60s, actually, um, THC was discovered. So tetrahydrocannabinol was discovered. And um, basically, uh, you know, it was, it was understood to be a primary active agent in the psychoactivity of cannabis. Not long after that, uh, some researchers also discovered that we manufacture in our own bodies two cannabinoids and that these cannabinoids are, are very active throughout our bodies. Eventually, we came to learn that we have receptors throughout the entire body, uh, in the brain, along the nerves, in all, almost all the organs, in muscles, in, in fascia, in bones, everywhere. Uh, that are, are receptors for these unique agents called cannabinoids. Now, in, in, uh, we make these out of dietary oils and fats. Uh, and there is good reason to believe that many people don't make enough of these. Uh, we can also get cannabinoids from exterior or external sources, the most concentrated and readily available of which is cannabis. And cannabis uh, satisfies uh, different receptors in the endocannabinoid system. So uh, some receptors that are responsive to THC, some receptors that are responsive to CBD. Um, but together there are, well, there, are, there are more, apparently more cannabinoid receptors in the brain, for example, than any other type of receptor. Hmm. So we know that cannabis 
with its unique composition of cannabinoids, and I'm not even getting to the terpenes that also have biological activity, um, that the cannabinoids feed the endocannabinoid system, basically fill it up, in, if you will, in a way. Um, and the endocannabinoid system is a harmonizing system. You know, you've got your cardiovascular system and respiration and immune function and nervous system and your endocrine system and all this stuff. They all need to be somewhat in uh, harmonious attunement with each other so that they don't go completely imbalanced and berserk and you get sick and die. Um, when we consume cannabis, we help to satisfy that system, help to keep that harmonious balance among all of the other organ systems. And how that plays into yoga is that if you're in a, a more fundamentally homeostatic state anyway, uh, with lower inflammation, which is typical when you've fed the endocannabinoid system, with greater awareness and sensitivity to you know, all the senses and a greater ability to uh, actually feel nerve activity, then you have this beautiful combination of the two that can really enhance your, your experience of yoga as you're practicing. But in and of itself, the endocannabinoid system is a st staggeringly important modern discovery about human biology, and cannabis uh, is uniquely available to uh, feed and satisfy the endocannabinoid system. Mm. <clears throat> what you said there reminds me of um, of uh, sort of the erasing of the role stigmatized or taboo plants play in the advances of modern science right because uh well i i think endocannabinoid you know very quickly you're like oh yeah like uh that's that's connected to cannabis right but then even like endorphin you know that was discovered through what we discovered out of the the opium poppy we discovered right. what this these these uh molecules are and then we discovered oh hey we actually have a whole system for this oh hey these things that that work inside of us, they're actually similar endorphin, you know, morphine like molecules inside. Right. But right. then also even the discovery of the serotonergic system um, and all the drugs, all the, all the, you know, SSRIs, antidepressant drugs that came out of that is very much, you know, very much heavily influenced by the discovery of LSD and what it does to, mm -hmm. to the brain. And yet it kind of gets washed away in a sense with LSD, especially it kind of got washed away and it became about like, the advances of SSRIs rather than being like the advances of LSD, which allowed us this other thing so that we could shovel LSD away and whatever else. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have a, um, a fondness for LSD because I started with LSD, did a lot of it from uh, 67 to 72, a tremendous amount, and um, have microdosed with LSD uh, from time to time in more, in more recent years. And what I think is that, um, I mean, I, in my own mind, I kind of grandfather it in. I mean, I'm a plant guy, you know, I like mushrooms. I like ayahuasca, you know, I like San Pedro, I like peyote. Um, and yet I have this um, reverence for LSD and think that it is one of the greatest of all of the psychedelics. There's just this beauty to it, perhaps because of its time in history, uh, what it enabled uh, many of us in, in my generation to do, which is just totally blow apart uh, the 50s gray model and replace it with something a lot more colorful and diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I don't even know where I'm going with that. I, basically, I'm expressing a, a, an unabashed love for and appreciation for LSD. Oh, and I, I know that the, the connecting point to that is I do think that microdosing LSD, which is something that a great many people are turned on to all over the place, uh, will uh, only further be recognized as highly valuable for people with a lot of you know mood difficulties, uh, who might otherwise be turning to the SSRIs and, and other agents out there that really don't seem to do the trick. 
Mm. And there, it's also possible that uh, that that's all placebo as well. I mean, recent research came out that suggested it was placebo. Personally, I, my mm. immediate inclination was like, that's not the case. And then I was like, my next inclination was like, that sounds like I'm being biased and selective with my information. And then I was like, I should probably read that article, but I never did. Um, but it, it, did you read that? Do you have any comments on it? What, the 2005 JAMA article discrediting SSRIs as a category? <laughs> no, no, but I'm no. glad you brought that in. No, the, uh, the, the recent article that suggested that the benefits of microdosing is placebo and not pharmacological. Uh-huh. Um, I think that is a classic case of rectal cranial inversion. <laughs> okay all right it, it, it's blatant horse shit hmm. um you know you look you can have a placebo effect among people for a particular period of time um, but you can't have a widespread placebo effect among a lot of people for a lot of time I started microdosing psilocybin mushrooms in an extract form, a few drops a day in 1983. Only we didn't have the term microdosing. And I did it because I noticed I got this little brightening effect. And I thought, well, that's kind of curious. I like that. And so I would, you know, when I wanted a brightening effect, I'd do three, four drops in my tongue and let it go. And I'd just kind of get this little... Um, I have found consistently with LSD, uh, you know, 25 micrograms or so, a nice, clear bump uh, in alertness. And also, I think, uh, slightly greater self-awareness overall. Um, and in just, you know, reading James Fadiman and a number of other people, I, 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 I don't. I will read the article now that you've mentioned it, but only just because I want to find out what nonsense they've gotten themselves into. Mm. Yeah, I haven't read it, so I can't I can't speak to it. But um, <laughs> I definitely, I definitely wondered about. To me, twenty five mics is is definitely not a microdose. That is, it is on. <laughs> it is not sub perceptual. I notice it. Twenty five mics is like a yeah. I want to be awake and alert and having fun at a party, but not actually challenged right. in any way. I think I'll take twenty five <laughs> mics. Um, well, you know, that was the dose of the original Delicid tablets that uh, uh, Sandoz made. The first LSD ever came in 25 mic tablets. Oh, and curious. you did them in increments. Um, boy, I would love to get hold of a bottle of that. But all we <laughs> have we are all? photos of the bottles and the labels. Uh, but yeah, 25 mics was the starting dose, you know, and then you would just sort of work up from there. Mm -hmm. I had encountered some liquid a few years ago that was 25 mics a drop. And I asked why that was the case. And they said, uh, well, so you can modify your dose better. And also <clears throat> so that if you accidentally took two, when you only meant to take one, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you're, you're yeah. not as screwed in some sense. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so I have, a I have a question going back to, I mean, like LSD could, could fall into this, you know, um, but uh, it goes back to, combination of cannabis and and yoga so cannabis and spiritual practice um this is changing now what i'm about to say around stigma um and especially around psychedelics there's a real sort of opening around like oh yeah psychedelics can be a mark of a legitimate spiritual practice or a legitimate sort of adjunct to a spiritual practice mm -hmm. but there are also still a lot of people who feel as though you know something like drugs are cheating, for example, or people who might say that like, that, that yoga, that you're, that you shouldn't mix drugs and yoga, for example. Um, and I'm wondering if you could comment on that stigma. Um, and, and in particular, I'd be curious to hear also where you think that that stigma might be reflective of a fair concern as much as where you might see it as being off base. Well, I like the Allen Ginsberg comment that, you know, people who denigrate cannabis are fakers who haven't had the experience. I mean, um, and what I, what I think is that we have gone through an extended period of time 
in which, um, you know, elevating yourself with cannabis or psychedelics has been perceived as something for losers, dangerous, um, you know, a gateway to ruin. You're going to wind up in an alley with a needle in your arm. I mean, all of that stuff. Yeah, not We've to been, mention all that, the reefer madness stuff yeah, and, the, and its yeah. basis and racism and racial segregation right. and all the rest. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, just horrifying stuff. It, it is no surprise that people have concerns about it. Um, it's no surprise that people often still regard it as, eh, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm not so sure that's a good idea. What I can tell you is that in the, the yoga conferences that I've, you know, taught at for the past, whatever, 30 years or so, um, those of us who are teachers would teach our classes and then we'd get together afterwards, you know, before dinner and get high and figure out where we were going to go out to eat. And we did that as a matter of course. And we did that all the time. And, and you know, talented, like the most popular yoga teachers you know of who are on the covers of all the magazines that have anything to do with yoga. Um, that's just what we did. And among us, there was this sense that we couldn't actually carry it into the classroom. Uh, now that's different. Um, I, I think, I think all of these things happen unevenly. You can absolutely find people who would be alarmed by the very notion of utilizing psychedelics for any purpose. Um, you know, uh, fueled by misinformation and suspicion that has gone on for, for decades and you can also find people who are saying, gosh, you know, I've read more and more about this and it really seems like, you know, they were good for you after all. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have everything in between. Um, what ultimately I believe makes the difference is when uh, you represent these things in a fine way. I mean, when, when Carl Sagan said that he got high and tripped a lot, you kind of couldn't argue with, well, you know, what a stupid slouch. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it really ruined his life. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. You know, yeah. we found out that like Louis Armstrong literally got high every single day of his adult life. Mm -hmm. You go, okay, best trumpet player ever in, on earth in all of history and amazing loving guy and apparently wonderful in every respect and like to get high. Okay. Um, you know, uh, when you, when you read, uh, various figures, men and women who have utilized these things and gone on to do, to do wonderful things, I, I think it's part of the counterbalance against this negativity. Um, you can, you can do it all wrong. You can get too loaded and get on the yoga mat and just be stupid. That can happen. Um, uh, you can utilize psychedelics so much that you're not doing the actual living in and integration part of it. Um, you know, that's also real. I mean, I have encountered a lot of people down in ayahuasca land in Peru who have been down there, you know, drinking for the last year and a half or something. And in general, I don't recommend it. It doesn't seem like that's really doing something astonishingly great for people. Uh, it, it seems to be in the, it, it seems to be that the proof of whether this is beneficial or not has to do in how you live your life. If I practice yoga without cannabis and I'm a nice guy and I practice yoga with cannabis and I'm a total asshole, well, maybe that combination is not right for me. Mm. But if whatever I do, either one or nobody knows, if I come out of the gate friendly and welcoming and open and considerate and compassionate and loving and energized and, and engaged in all of that, well, then who cares You know what concerns people have had over time? Um, that's how I settle out with it. I don't know if that fully answers what you were asking, but that's just kind of the, the place I get to about it. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great address of the question. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, Carl Hart and his premise of like drug use for grownups. Um, you know, like <laughs> if you're, 
if, if you're doing fine and everything is good and your life is bettered by it, you know, or at the very least it's not harmed by it and you're still a good person in the world and doing your thing and caring for all your responsibilities, then do whatever right. you want. Take whatever right. drug you like, you know? Sure. Um, so, uh, um, oh, there was, hold on. It's, it's fallen away. Just give me a sec. Come back, come back, come back. There it is. There it is. Okay. So you said, you know, like if I'm using yoga and cannabis and I'm, you know, turning into an asshole, then maybe it's not a good combination. But what about, what about the, the risk of, of psychosis, of psychotic episodes? Now this is present with cannabis, perhaps more so than some of the other psychedelics, even from what I understand, um, at least for schizophrenia. What about, what about that? And, and this is a bigger question because, because mixed up in the, you know, what happens if I start to lose my grip on reality when mixing yoga and cannabis is also mixed up with this other question is like, what is reality? And is my psychosis a Kundalini awakening? Or do I really need some psychiatric help right now? How do I know the difference? And see, it it opens a huge question. So maybe just start with the smallest morsel, and then we'll see what see what comes. Well, uh excuse me i'm just found a tick walking <laughs> across my desk <laughs> um people do have mental problems and um uh, you know i remember in um well actually i remember one of the most harsh examples of that i walked around the corner of a 21 story dormitory, uh, where I was, uh, in college at the university of Massachusetts, just in time to watch a guy dive off the 19th floor. Wow. And, uh, so I was there while he hit and the whole big thing that happened afterwards. And he had been having terrible problems with, um, psychedelics and, uh, actually he needed psychiatric care, but you know, so, I mean, People can go wrong and they do go wrong and there is no guarantee. Uh, I mean, I I knew in in my teen years, despite the fact that I knew a tremendous number of people who tripped, I knew precious few who ran into trouble. Uh, Or if they did, it was a scary event or moment rather than the collapse of the psyche. Mm -hmm. But you're correct. People can and do, um, you know, have mental problems. And, uh, you know, my advice is if you've got mental problems, you know, uh, when you go to the coffee shops in Amsterdam, they have these little cards that kind of give you some suggestions and tips on what to do and not to do, like not to get so loaded, you can't take care of yourself kind of thing. And they also say, you know, Cannabis will not solve your problems. Um, if you if you are a person of um, delicate mental condition, fragile mental mental condition, uh, prone to uh, going over the edge, none of these things may be right for you. I mean, it could in fact be that you're one of those anomalous cases that you, you know, do 20 times too much the LSD and your mental problems disappear forever. That's also a possibility. Mm -hmm. But I think the smart, considerate, thoughtful advice is if you got mental problems, don't compound them by getting stoned or tripping. Mm. So then... uh Excellent advice. Um, I would, I would, I would also add, unless you're under the care of a skilled professional, um, because possibly the right, the right, uh, the right psychedelic and the right dose and the right context held by a skilled facilitator can help. Um, but I think what you're talking about here is maybe something outside of that kind of structured context. Well, yeah, and, and you know, and I do want to say, I mean, I appreciate. It's funny, you know. Uh, when I was starting out in yoga, everybody wanted to be a guru. And then over the past bunch of years, everybody wanted to be a shaman. Everybody wants to be a psychedelic assistant therapist. And that's okay. <laughs> no that's shit, okay. Right? That's fine. You yeah. know, it's great. It's less messy than everybody wanting to be a colonic therapist. Okay. <laughs> but, 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 but there are no requirements that you have taken out, that you have done psychedelics. None. So 
what I think is that, um, yes, you know, you want people, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but, uh, I think it's ludicrous that people who haven't tripped a couple of dozen times anyway, gotten their feet wet in the psychedelic pool can be psychedelic assistance therapists. Mm -hmm. I mean, some things like empathy, listening to people, caring for them, paying attention to them, all that, you know, these are universals among decent qualified therapists. But, um, I think we have a big storm brewing with people of greatly inconsistent experience taking a crack at what's going on with folks on the couch. Oh yeah. And I mean, like the, especially, especially given that one of the elements of psychedelics is that they are, and forever will be completely beyond our conceptual grasp right. and, <laughs> and, and the grasping for it at times, I mean, they're even beyond our conception of them being on <laughs> beyond our conceptual grasp, you know, and our grasping for it can cause a lot of a lot of distress. And, and looking back at something, uh, someone I hold as a teacher in my life, Stephen Jenkinson had said, yeah. which is like, you know, encounters with the divine with like, the big thing, aren't necessarily all good. Sometimes they destroy you. And mm. that's pleasurable, but it's also not. You know, like there's 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 reasons why there is temple and ritual and ceremony and all these things because otherwise it will destroy you, right? And that's not a that's not a that is not an experience that is necessarily best served or best understood through the framework of a university educated psychotherapist or psychologist. Right. 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 And exactly. to think that somebody can feel as though they are capable of having somebody sense make an experience like that or hold space for a person to have an experience like that and to be the person that cares for them in a way that really allows experiences that big to not wreck a person, I think is, is, is hubris. First off, you know, well, at, sure. the, at the very least know what it is to be wrecked by the mystery you know, right. so that you don't accidentally pathologize it or or turn it into a, or or psychologize it or whatever it is. Also, or guilty. think you understand what the person's going through. Totally, yes, right, yeah. And right. I also know that here in Canada, for example, there's and as you probably know, a lot of these people who are the psychedelic therapists, you know, they're also they've taken the psychedelics. Mm-hmm. They don't talk about it because it will ruin their credibility, but they've done it, you know? And here in Canada, there's a lot of people who, there are organizations of people who are not only pressing for access to give psilocybin to patients, but they're also, and have effectively pressed for access for their therapists to have mm-hmm. experiences too, because they're like, this is necessary. Sure, and yet sure. you can get, and yet in the United States, from what I understand, you can go, I could be a, I can be a certified psychiatrist, psych, psychologist, you know, or psychotherapist or whatever, never done psychedelics in my life, never done drugs in my right. life. Right. And I can go to a weekend workshop on ketamine. And then from that point on, I could administer like mind blowing doses of ketamine to a person. And mm-hmm. I am now considered a legitimate facilitator for that experience, which is, right. I think, right. did you lose the word ludicrous? Um, because I feel like that's the word that's coming up when I think about it. Yeah. Well, look, these are wild, freaky times, and I think we're going to see, you know, a lot of uh, advances in medicine. I think we're going to see a lot of upheaval. Um, I'm I'm grateful that psychedelics are are being given, you know, far greater consideration. I do believe that they have a role in spiritual life, uh, and that. You know, the intention is is very valuable. I mean, it's essential, you know. Uh, I, I don't think you have to be ceremonial about psychedelics all the time. I think there's absolutely a place for, uh, you know, tripping and playing in the river. Oh, totally. um, yeah. You know, all of that. And, and in fact, I think that as this... Um, psychedelic therapy thing grows 
uh, at the very same time, there's going to be even more of a proliferation of people and groups uh, doing psychedelics in nature, you know, more uh, organized events of that types, more workshops of that type. It's like, well, you know, you can lie on soft, comfy furniture with eye shades, holding a therapist's hand, listening to white noise while you're tripping. Or if you'd like, you can be in a forest among some of the largest trees in the world and, you know, all of that. Um, so I think we'll also see people uh, deliberately and intentionally pushing tripping in nature as an alternative to this, uh, you know, mall stop uh, psychedelic therapy uh, in an office kind of thing that we're we are also going to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's assuming that we get uh, decriminalization with medicalization and not just prohibition 2.0 and call it medicalization. Um, and I think also I want to go back and say, like, I totally agree with what you're saying, you know, and, uh, also go back and say that, um, you had said something about empathy and, and, uh, these types of skills being great for helping a person. And I think that's why pretty much anyone can be a good trip sitter, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about is when you're proclaiming to tell someone, yeah, okay, now we're going to go back and we're right. going to help you heal this yeah. extreme trauma or this extreme depression or this like, you want to kill yourself? Okay, well, let's give you some psychedelics. I'm going to help you understand that. But they've never okay. taken psychedelics <laughs> themselves. Right. You know, it feels, yeah, it feels, it feels like certainly more dangerous than it needs to be. <laughs> you know, like yeah. there, there is yeah. risk management well, and, and well, having a sense of it yourself is one of those risk management. Things. Well, and, and I think, you know, there was uh, recently an article and and you might even know who this entity is uh, there's a, a company that's trying to develop psychedelics without the psychedelic experience mm -hmm. Sec was so, it second gen psychedelics yeah, yeah okay and and that's just such a ridiculous proposition you know it is in fact the experience that is the whole thing. If you look at, uh, two, I mean, two two studies. One, there was an LSD and um, alcoholic addiction study done a while ago, and what the what the researchers found was that LSD was helpful uh, for many people in eliminating alcohol use, but it was most helpful among those who had a full blown mystical experience. Mm -hmm. It appears that the mystical experience, that the uh, dissolution of the self and the sense of the all and the everything and oneness and, and complete interconnectedness and inseparability with everything is a fundamentally and intrinsically healing thing. Uh, we saw that with the uh, Johns Hopkins study of, of terminal cancer patients that, um, you know, the people who lost their fear of death, which is quite remarkable for stage four cancer patients, uh, were people who had profound spiritual or mystical experiences. So it is an experiential thing. It's not something that you can just sort of quietly rewire your brain, you know, or, oh, you just, you know, go about your business and, you know, have a latte and, you know, take two of these in the morning and you'll be fine. You'll be psychedelicized. No, you won't. It's the experience. Uh, and I, I had a curious conversation with somebody involved with a psychedelic investment firm the other day who really wanted to, you know, not talk about nature, not talk about indigenous native people from which all these things derive and originate and, and, you know, take any concern of the wildness out of psychedelics. <laughs> I was thinking, well, if you take all the concern of the wildness out of psychedelics, uh, you don't have psychedelics anymore. Right, right. Yeah, part part of it is part of it is the fact that you're always possibly getting bucked off the horse, you know. And if you get rid of that, then you're just riding a pony on, at a at a carnival ride. Right, um, right. So, so what makes me think that is is I actually I'm I'm very supportive and encouraging that if there can be research done. <laughs> And and the production of second gen psychedelics that work with the mechanism of action that psychedelics have that don't produce a, a result, that don't produce a psychedelic experience, but seem to produce positive experiences in a person's life, uh, maybe akin to microdosing, you know, 
or akin to what is fabled, uh, SSRIs will offer you and do right. offer most people with significant side effects about 50% of the time it works, you know, <laughs> little, little more than placebo. <clears throat> if, if those drugs can be produced and they have less side effects and they're more effective than the current antidepressants that we have and people are down to take them every day and it betters their life, great. Mm -hmm. And let's not call them psychedelics. No. And let's not lose psychedelics in the process. You know, because right. like we threw LSD out to focus on SSRIs and it was clear that we lost the baby with the bathwater on that one. Right. And so I don't think we should do it here either or think that, think that these second gen psychedelics are the solution to the problem that is the psychedelic experience. And that once we solve that problem, we can let that whole psychedelic thing go because now we have the better path forward, which I know right. some people are thinking about it this way from a business perspective you know, uh, and even from a medical perspective. But I mean, as we both might agree, that is sloppy and, and uh, what we'll say it's, it's narrow thinking, very narrow thinking. Look, like in 1967, the Jimi Hendrix experience came out with an album that asked a question that was like a shot across the bow of the entire culture. And it was, are you experienced? Mm -hmm. And those of us who were knew exactly what they meant and said, yes. And those who weren't said, I don't know. Um, and it's this way with psychedelics, you know, that's what it was. It was had, did you drop acid? Had you had that experience? And, um, I see a lot of people, uh, just as I've seen in the natural products industry, a lot of unhealthy people who smoke outside who, you know, get involved because there's money to be made. And we see this in the psychedelic scene. Certainly, you know, I'm giving a talk, uh, soon called, uh, down the pharmaceutical rabbit hole. Uh, which I talk about all this, but uh, basically, you know, you get a lot of people involved with psychedelics who haven't had the psychedelic experience. Um, and I don't really think that that adds up to the kind of thoroughly thoughtful intelligence pool that we want driving this sector forward. Fortunately, the so-called underground or extra legal market is so very, very well developed and so extensively well stocked, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and there's such availability of psychedelics for so many people that we do have, in fact, a, a thriving situation. Um, but I think, I think we're headed into some really, really weird, weird times with the um, pharmaceutical gold rush that I liken to the El Dorado quest. I think a lot of people are going to be boiling their saddles and struggling to get home alive. Hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> I didn't know that the boiling the saddles, uh, struggling to get home alive is a very cool, uh, <laughs> like image, image that came into my head and associated to like, uh, the amount of money that's going to get lost. Oh, I mean, oh, un man. unless compass pathways is effective at, at um, patenting patenting holding hands because then then certainly compass is going to make some money because you're gonna have to pay him back pay him out every time um but yeah okay so let's 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 come down a little bit from the psychedelic realms uh well go back down into different psychedelic realms cannabis and maybe ask this sort of final question to close out before we get more information about your book and where people can follow you and and all the rest of that stuff so this question is this your book ends with a thorough discussion about how to infuse cannabis into your yoga practice and an entire sequence, step-by-step, -step, with photos <clears throat> of a practice you can infuse cannabis into. Lots of helpful tips, suggestions for consumption, and a number of other things. Um, as such, anyone interested in mixing cannabis and yoga from the perspective by which you are engaging that combination. I mean, anyone can mix cannabis and yoga, but the way in which you've, mm -hmm. you've, you've set the mind, you've built the mindset for it and present the practice would be served by actually going and getting your book, reading it, trying that out. Um, but might be, there might be a lot of people who are like, you know what? They're coming out the end of this podcast and they're thinking, you know what? I might just burn one and get on the mat and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the 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 confine of a of a single piece of advice um but you can go over that if you want. Is there any one piece of advice 
you feel you'd like to offer anyone who's going to light up after this and do some yoga, like any one particularly important piece of advice that if they took anything from this podcast, that they would hang on this as they step into that infused practice? Well, one thing I would say is, is if you want to try this out, um, then, you know, take a single hit of ganja or, you know, a, a single little bit of vape or something or a small edible. Don't get yourself just completely massively stoned. Um, <clears throat> and if you're going to do that, then as you practice, um, remember to pay extra attention to the sensations in your body, to any feelings in your skin, to any feelings that you might experience you know, in your nervous system. I mean, those are the things I would suggest. Look, like any endeavor, um, I, I personally believe that having more knowledge is useful. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't just simply have some cannabis and try practicing and see what happens. Uh, you, you absolutely can. And people have done that for thousands of years. Um, I'd argue that if you read my book, you'll know more and probably get more out of the experience. Mm -hmm. But if you just are cautious in the amount that you do, so you're not just getting too ridiculously high at the start, and then really spend your time, you know, focusing on your experience, you know, not, uh, not overlaying anything, not trying to visualize something, not trying to make something happen, just paying attention to what's going on inside you. I think you'll find that you, you can have a richer uh, experience in certain ways. Great. Thank you, Chris. Sure. Uh, so, where do we where do we read your book? Why do, where do listeners get a hold of the Lotus and the Bud? And where can people learn more about you in general, which includes a number of books that you've written, if if I am correct, and uh, and um, a, a lot of background that you've been doing over the years, a lot of great stuff that you have out there uh, with your work as the medicine hunter. Well, it, people can go to my website, medicinehunter.com. And there they'll find information on me and my books and a lot of links to uh, different media I've done and, and quite a bit of photography of indigenous people. Um, you can also go on to, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, any of the online uh, booksellers and get the Lotus and the Bud. Um, you can look at Medicine Hunter on Facebook uh, medicine hunter on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I'm doing sort of all of the social media propaganda that people are doing these days. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I would say medicinehunter.com is a good kind of hub to find out more. Great. I'll make sure those links are contained in the show notes to this episode, wherever you are checking it out, listeners, uh, as well as at jameswjesso.com, but uh, medicinehunter.com to learn more about Chris and his work. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, and thank and you, James. Thank you. Really appreciated the conversation. Great interview. I, I like what you're doing very much. Thank you. And cut. Okay, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. We've got the Lotus in the Bud here on YouTube. Uh, if you can see it, that's, uh, that's Chris's most recent book, the one that we talked about uh, today. Go pick it up. It's cool read. The yoga practice is interesting. Um, and I personally find combining cannabis and yoga to be beautiful for myself. Certainly not making any recommendations for anyone. You listen to the episode. It's uh, cautious. It's a careful thing to step into, or I invite carefulness in stepping into it. Uh, but yeah, so... If you like this episode, you can become a patron on Patreon. I talked about that in the beginning, patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso. Um, or you can just share this around if you don't have financial uh, capacity to contribute. Uh, you could also do a one-time donation through crypto or um, PayPal. All of that is linked below. You could also uh, buy a ticket to this upcoming course that I mentioned at the beginning. So this episode was sponsored by Maps of the Minds course Revolutions. I'm also now an affiliate, so I will earn a small commission for you purchasing a ticket. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the course now, and then I'm going to tell you about this sort of like extra discount possibility. So uh, Revolution is an online deep dive course for psychedelic explorers consisting of audio lessons and live calls. 
Revolution is designed to empower you on your path of psychedelic exploration so you can cultivate a more focused approach, go deeper on your journeys, reap positive and lasting effects, explore different ways of using psychedelics, and connect with others. Throughout the course, participants will have a chance to connect with other members, explore complementary practices, and develop their own personalized approach. It begins on November 1st, and up until November 1st, you can use, utilize the promo code GESSO for 15% off, and you do so by heading to mapsofthemind.com slash r-evolution. So revolution, but with a dash between the R and the E. Um, and there are tiered tickets. So the tier that's still available that's cheaper than the main price is Advocate. So if you use the code Advocate Gesso, you get 15% off the discounted price too. So definitely check that out. For context, I obviously, the course hasn't happened yet. I haven't taken it. I did have a long and thorough sit down with John, the person organizing the course behind Maps of the Mind. And I felt confident that what he has to offer is likely in line with adventures through the mind. And it's possible that I might even have them on the show to talk about it in more detail. So yeah, I can't guarantee what the course is going to be about. It hasn't happened yet. I've looked at the uh, details, seen the sort of content that he's going to talk about, hearing about how he's putting it together. It seems like a cool course and it seems like something that I was down to get behind. But of course it is to your discretion. Um, thank you so much for tuning in, listening all the way to the end. And I will uh, see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. And until then, take care. <laughs>